The, uh, the subject that I'm going to be talking about today is concurrency, and really this, this talk divides up into two halves. There's, there's a half where I'm going to scare you. I'm going to show you why concurrency is much, much harder to get right than I think most, uh, most programmers realise. Um, but then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to explain some uh, techniques which uh, are becoming more and more popular uh, these days, uh, which go a long way towards addressing the problems I'm going to be talking about in the first half. So who am I? Uh, so my name is Paul Butcher, uh, and I'm the author of this book, Seven Concurrency Models in Seven Weeks, that was published a few months ago by the Pragmatic Programmers. Um, and that's, that, if you like, that's my, um, uh, uh, my reason for being here. Um, but before I talk about concurrency, I want to talk about something much, much more interesting and something much closer to my heart. Motor racing. Now, this is me. Um, this is my toy. Um, if anybody out there has more money than you know what to do with and you desperately want to get rid of it, I can strongly recommend motor racing. It's a fantastic way to get rid of any money that's, uh, that's cluttering up your wallet. And in fact, if you've got any money cluttering up your wallet, come talk to me and I can destroy it in seconds. <laughs> um, but of course, this isn't what motor racing is normally like. This is just me on a circuit by myself. It's actually quite difficult to have an accident when you're on a circuit all by yourself. That is what motor racing is normally like. Um, and of course, when you've got 18 cars being driven by 18 very competitive people, all trying to share exactly the same piece of track, what you tend to get is this. Um, so th this, this happened um, towards the beginning of, of last year. Um, happily, I wasn't one of the drivers involved in, in that particular coming together. Um, and uh, just to reassure you all, everybody walked away from it. Um, wallets were damaged. Um, but no, no drivers were damaged. Um, now, why am I showing you this? Well, of course, this is, this is the kind of thing that can happen when we start having multiple threads all trying to share resources. In this particular example, it was two cars trying to share a resource known as a racetrack, um, but when we're writing code, um, the resources we're trying to share are memory and threads and locks and, and all the rest of it. So what I'm going to be talking about today is basically how do we make sure we have lots of this without having any of that. So, what is it that makes threaded code hard to get right? Now, I'm betting, given that the people in this room are a bunch of very experienced programmers, you can create a long, long list of things that make concurrent code, multi-threaded code, hard to get right. And you're going to have things on there like deadlock, live lock, lock contention, scalability, priority inversion, and the list goes on. I'm not going to talk about any of these things. You know about them, and they are real problems. They're difficult. There's no question about it. They're very difficult things to get right. But actually, I don't think this is the most difficult problem. The most difficult problem with multi-threaded programming is one that nobody ever talks about, and that is the memory model. Now, I just want a quick show of hands. Who here knows what the memory model of Java is in the, in the context of multiple threads? Have we got anybody here who's... Uh, Really, nobody? I can't. There must be at least one person in this room who's familiar with the memory model of Java. No? Excellent. Right. OK, we've got one. We have one. Excellent. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, please, to not answer the questions which I'm going to ask, because uh, you're going to spoil the surprise for everybody else. Um, so to show you an example of what I'm talking about, I'm going to show you a little piece of code. Um, so there we go. So here we have a Java program. You're looking at the entire source code of the program. So it's not a very long program. It shouldn't, I imagine, be a difficult program to work out what it is that it's going to do. Um, we have two threads. We have a thread T1, and we have a thread T2. And we're going to start both of them. All thread T1 does is set this uh, integer variable called answer to the number 42 and set a Boolean flag to true. And our second thread is going to check our Boolean flag, and it's going to print out either what the answer is, or it's going to say it doesn't know what the answer is. OK? So it's all very simple. So here's the quiz. What can this code do? What are the possible outputs from this code? Come on. I, there must be somebody in here who's brave enough. Yes, sir. Okay. 
well done. I'm, I'm impressed. So, there are two answers that you would expect that you could get. Yes, you would expect to see the meaning of life is 42, because in this instance, answer ready has been set to true, therefore answer must be 42. And the second one is to say, I don't know the answer. But as our gentleman in the audience pointed out, there is a third out outcome that we can get here. And that is for the, uh, the string, the meaning of life is zero to be printed. Now, I'm hoping that this is surprising to you guys, yeah? I mean, why aren't you jumping up and down and shouting and screaming? How, how can the answer to this possibly be the meaning of life is zero? I mean, surely the only way that that can happen is if those two lines of code have been flipped, yeah? So the problem is the memory model. The problem is we have no synchronization in this code. And in the absence of synchronization, the memory model in Java is able to do anything at all that it likes, up to and including flipping those two lines. It gets weirder. Let's imagine that I change this code so it doesn't say if answer ready, but it says while not answer ready, do nothing, and then print out the answer. What can this code do? I'm going to go back to our friend over there who knew the answer the first time. So what, what are the possible outputs of this program? So actually, there's a new answer which we can get here. So you're right. We could get the answer, the, the, so the answer, the meaning of life is 42. We could get the answer, the meaning of life is zero. But the other thing it could do is it could never exit. Potentially, this code will never, ever exit. It could sit in an infinite loop. Now, the question is, why have we got ourselves in this situation? What's caused us to get into a situation where really, really simple code like this can result in such completely bizarre answers? And the reason for that actually goes back to um, chip design. So I'm going to switch back to... So we're all familiar with this graph, yes? This is the graph of transistor count on uh, chips over the years. Um, Moore's law telling us that um, as, the, uh, as time goes on, the number of transistors on chips has doubled. And as we can see from the line down below, the performance, the single core performance of these has tailed off. So in about 2004-ish, our cores stopped getting any faster. And this is the cause of that thing we all know about called the multi-core crisis. Now, that's an interesting thing, but you've all seen this graph before, and that's not the interesting part of this graph. The interesting part of the graph is that bit. Why is it that increasing the number of transistors on our CPUs has made them go so much faster? Um, I mean, part of what's going on is that as the transistors have got smaller, they've got faster. So our clock rates have gone from a few megahertz up into the gigahertz. But that doesn't explain why adding uh, you know, 10 million transistors to a, uh, to a CPU makes it go any faster. So why is it that things have got faster? The answer is parallelism. So yeah, part of it is increasing clock speed, but part of it is we've got bit level parallelism. So we've gone from an 8-bit CPU to a 16-bit, and then a 32-bit, and then a 64-bit CPU. And these days, if you want to, um, uh, you want to add two 32-bit numbers, it's a single operation, whereas in the, uh, in the old days, you had to do a whole series of 8-bit operations. But even that doesn't explain why adding 10 million transistors to your CPU makes it go any faster. That tells you why doubling or quadrupling the number of transistors on your CPU makes it go faster. What's really made it go faster is instruction-level parallelism. So these days, when, you, uh, when your CPU executes instructions, it doesn't do it sequentially. It's doing prefetching. It's doing branch prediction. It's doing loop unrolling. It's reordering things under your feet. And because it's doing that, that's what results in that weirdness that we saw before, where we write what on the face of things is a really simple piece of code, but in fact, under the hood, it is really true those two lines of code can be switched. So then the question becomes, what do we do about this? Well, the answer is we use threads and locks. We put synchronization in place. We use the synchronized keyword in Java. 
turns out to be really, really tricky to get right. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more depth. Um, but before I do that, I want to show you one of the other things that makes writing threads and locks code particularly tough. Um, I'm going to show you a really, really simple class. There it is. That's the entire uh, source code of the class. And that class has a concurrency bug in it. And I'm wondering if anybody here can spot the concurrency bug. Why is this not going to work properly when we... Exactly, thank you. So the problem is, simple date format isn't thread safe. Now the question I'm going to ask you guys is, how do you know that? Looking at that code, if you haven't read the documentation for simple date format, how do you know that the code you've just written here isn't safe? Um, I mean, we've got a single private final member variable. Why on earth would I need to add any locks to this? I'm doing something to it, format.parse. That's not going to change the, the, uh, the state of simple date format. Um, so how do I look at this in order to work out that my code isn't thread safe? And that brings us to what I think is really the, um, the most interesting uh, part of this. What I'm going to call the elephant in the room, testing. If you've got a piece of code as simple as those pieces of code that I've shown you today, and you can't look at them and easily work out what they're going to do, how on earth do you know that your code is correct? Well, the answer is you know your code is correct by testing it. But how are you going to write tests which are going to um, uncover some of these issues? Um, now, I'm going to do something probably a little bit foolish, and um, I've, I'm going to ask your forgiveness if it, um, if it doesn't work out. Um, I'm going to show you a piece of code um, that's in some open source that I wrote a little while ago. So what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you the source code of uh, Scala Mock. Now, Scala Mock is a mocking framework for Scala. Um, it's something which I wrote, uh, I think, four years ago, um, been in constant development ever since, um, and is reasonably widely used in, the, um, uh, in a number of Scala projects. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you to ex understand all of this code. I'm just going to pick out one very specific bit of it, and that very specific bit is this thing here, call log. Um, I discovered just three or four days ago that there's a concurrency bug in Scala Mock related to the way that um, call log is, um, is being used. I'm going to very quickly take you through a little piece of the code. So we've got this thing called Mock Factory Base. And this is what you mix into your, uh, your tests in order to work out if, you've got, um, if you want to, to do some mocking in your tests. Um, and we've got uh, this function here called with expectations, which is what allows you to set up expectations on mocks. And much as you would expect, it calls a function called initialize expectations. And initialize expectations is down here. It initializes call log. All very simple so far, yeah? And then we've got uh, this thing here called ordered handlers, which is, uh, now this is where you're going to have to just trust me on this. Um, we've got a, a method on there called handle, and this is called whenever somebody calls a method on a mock. And as you can see, it's synchronized. So whenever we handle one of these things, we are going to lock. And finally, at the point that it's actually called, so this is going to be called from inside handle. Um, we can see here we're using call log. Who spotted the, um, the concurrency bug in that? I mean, we're synchronized at the time that we do this. Where's the concurrency bug? Now, it's probably a little unfair to expect you to spot that because this is a bunch of code you've never seen before. The problem is that uh, where are we? In mock factory base, when we initialize call log, that's not synchronized. And because we've only got synchronization at the point that the data is used, and we don't have synchronization at the point that the data is initialized, it's quite possible that the initialization won't have found its way to the thread that's using it until after um, we try to use it. So now the question is, how did I find this? And the answer is, I've been writing tests for this for weeks. 
not one of them has failed. I cannot. I know there's a, there's a, 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 a concurrency bug in this code. Um, I've, I can see there's a concurrency bug in this code. I can prove by reading the code there's a concurrency bug in this code. I can't find any way of actually making a concurrency bug happen. So here's a case where I've got a concurrency bug in the code, which is very obvious now that I've seen it. I know that it's there, and even knowing that it's there, I can't find a way to write a test that fails. And this is the general problem with concurrency bugs. Either you can't write a test that fails, or you find yourself writing tests that only fail once every week, month, year. Almost certainly, somebody has seen this in, uh, in practice. Somebody somewhere has been using ScalaMock, and at some point they got some weird crash that they didn't understand. But they don't know that the problem is that it's a concurrency bug inside ScalaMock. Um, how are they going to how are they going to even begin to find it if it only happens once every every couple of months? And this is the kind of problem that we hit time and time and time again when we're writing threads and locks. And I contend it is impossible for you to write non-trivial code using threads and locks and get it right. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how well you understand concurrency. Um, I have a PhD in it. I've written a book about it and I've written this code, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so the answer, I believe, is don't use threads and locks. There is no way that you can get your code correct using threads and locks. So, let's go back to our... Uh, what's the bottom line? Bottom line is, Multi-threaded programming is hard. Um, actually, no. Multi-threaded programming is really, really hard. And what's the problem? Fundamentally, the problem is wherever we've got shared mutable data. So then the question becomes, what do we do about this? And this is where we get to the, I hope, the better half of this conversation, which is where we talk about the ways in which we can actually address this problem. And there are a bunch of different approaches that you can take to address it. And broadly speaking, I think they divide into three categories. Um, and it boils down to those two words, shared and mutable. So one approach that you can take is functional programming. And functional programming addresses this problem because if you don't have mutable data, you can't have shared mutable data. And if you don't have shared mutable data, all of a sudden your problems go away. So one of the ways that you can address concurrency issues is to move to functional programming. And because then you don't have mutable data, you don't have shared mutable data. There's another approach, though, which is to use message passing. And um, those of you who were in Stu Holloway's uh, talk just before lunch about core.async will have seen one example of this. Um, he was talking about uh, corded async, which is a, an implementation of communicating sequential proce uh, processes, but there are other message passing techniques, and one of those is actors. And in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about actors um, uh, later on in this, in this conversation. Um, so you can see a symmetry here, yes? We've got functional programming, which gets rid of the mutability side of things, and you've got message passing, which gets rid of the shared side of things. But actually there's a third thing that you can, uh, you can do, and that's you can find guaranteed thread safe shared mutable data structures. And this is the approach that Clojure takes with what um, uh, Stu Holloway calls its unified succession model and te technologies like um, uh, software transactional memory. Now I'm not going to talk about this in this conversation, but I want to mention it for completeness. Um, what I'm going to concentrate on are oops, the, uh, the first two of these. I'm going to talk a little bit about functional programming, and I'm going to talk a little bit about actors. But I just wanted, for completeness sake, to recognize that there are other approaches that, that we can take here. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at the functional programming side of things. And um, I'm going to be brave again, and I'm going to uh, actually start showing you some live code. So here we go. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm starting up a Clojure REPL. Um, now, those of you who've used Clojure will know that Clojure is not a pure functional language. But um, for the purpose of, of what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to be using 
the pure functional bits of closure. Um, so just in the interest of coming up with a really simple example, I'm going to look at writing a program which will sum a large number of numbers in parallel. And what do I need to do that in order to achieve that in a functional programming language? Um, so I'm going to start by just creating a big array of numbers. Um, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Clojure, um, all this has done is it's created a, a, an array of all of the integers between 0 and 10 million. Um, and I can show you that that's what if I do. Um, Let me head, so I'm in the wrong programming language. Ah. I can see that my first one is that. I can do something like take. See that the first ten are the first ten integers and so on. And if I want to um, if I want to sum everything in that, Clojure has this really nice function, like most functional languages do, called reduce. And I can say reduce using plus numbers and that is what you get if you sum all of the integers between 0 and 10 million. So that's worked. But that's just sequential. I have not done anything, anything parallel here. That's a perfectly ordinary sequential function just like any other. So just to get us a baseline, how long does this take? Um, now, I've uh, promised myself that um, I'm no longer, when I give uh, timings in talks like this, <coughs> to use uh, time, because the, as we all know, trying to do microbenchmarks on the JVM just by measuring individual invocations of functions is an extremely um, uh, inexact science. You get bad, bad answers. So there's this wonderful, wonderful library called uh, Criterium. And what Criterium does is it automates the process of taking measurements of um, microbenchmarks. And I, I strongly suggest anybody who's doing any kind of optimization on the JVM use Criterium or something like it, because it gives you much more accurate answers. Um, and then all I need to do is go back to my previous example, and I say quick bench. Now what this is doing under the hood is it's calling my function over and over and over again. And it's doing it um, enough times that it can measure the results that come back. Um, and it can take an average, and it can look at the spread, and it does things like make sure that hotspot has, has warmed up, so we're doing the, the, um, uh, the, the on-the-fly compilation of our code. So hopefully the answer that's going to come back actually is a, um, a representative um, uh, indication of how fast this code really is. Um, yes, and you can see it's also because it's um, using lots and lots of numbers, it's doing quite a lot of garbage collection. And there we go. So what this is telling us is that um, yes, when it's slow, sorry, no, yeah. uh, it's taking about 130, 139 seconds, let's call it. And actually, in this particular example, it's, um, uh, it's quite consistent whenever we, um, whenever we call this function, how fast it's going to be. So there's our benchmark. When we, when we sum the, um, the first 10 million numbers sequentially in closure, the answer is, or the, the length of time it takes is 139 milliseconds. So what do I need to do in order to parallelize this? Now, the beauty is, because I'm using functional code here, um, all I need to do is um, bring into scope this library called closure.core.reducers, and I replace my reduce with r slash fold. It gives me exactly the same uh, answer back. Now, the difference between reducers version of fold and reduce is that fold is doing this in parallel. Um, now, how do I prove that to you? Well, of course, I do it by using criterium again in order to measure it. So we can see how long this is going to take. And again, this is going off and running that many, many times and measuring it. And we have the, um, can everybody see that? Do I need to move that up the, um, up the screen a bit? Yeah, there you go. So Chat among yourselves while Criterium does its stuff. There we go. So now it's taking about 43 milliseconds. So all I've done is I've changed from reduce to fold, and I've got, what's that? That's about a, um, let's actually work it out. I'm going to do, take that. Oops. And that. 
So I've got a 3.2 times speed up just by changing from reduce to a fold. Um, now that's about right because this, this Mac that I'm running on has got four cores in it, so you know, with a little bit of overhead, a 3.2 times speed up is about what you would expect if I was using all of the cores in this Mac to their, um, to their full benefit. Now, how have I been able to do that? What is it about Clojure that's enabled me to get that speed up without having to write complicated code in order to, in order to do it? And the answer is, it's because Clojure is functional. And in particular, the plus function that we're calling there has no side effects. And because the plus function has no side effects, Fold can, um, can call as many of these in parallel as it wants to, knowing full well that they won't step on each other's toes. Now, I know some of you are looking at this thinking, yes, I know Plus has no side effects. Plus has no side effects in Java either. But in Clojure, every function has no side effects. Well, assuming you, um, you stick within the pure functional subset of Clojure, but most Clojure code does. So what that means is I can take any um, uh, any algorithm that I've already got which makes use of reduce and I can pass that, uh, that algorithm or change that algorithm to use fold within reducers and completely automatically without me having to do anything at all um, to the structure of my code I've managed to turn it into something which runs in parallel instead of something that runs um, in sequence. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about the functional programming side of things, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of how easy it is to take something which is functional and sequential and turn it into something which is functional and parallel. Um, what I want to spend a little bit more time talking about um, are actors, because I think um, although functional programming is, is very powerful, the, the step required to go from traditional imperative programming to functional programming is a relatively large one, whereas um, the step from going from imperative programming to actor programming is a much smaller one, as, as I hope um, will become obvious. So I'm going to start by showing you a really, really simple actor program. So where are we? So here we have. Uh, this is written in Scala. It's written in Scala making use of a library called Akka. Um, Akka is a general uh, concurrency library, but one of the things that it provides are actors for, uh, for Scala. Um, so what you're looking at here is, again, the entire source code of a, um, an, actors, an actor based program. Um, it's not doing anything particularly exciting, but hey, it is a complete, it is a complete program. So what we're doing is we're defining a counter, and we're saying that that counter is an actor. Um, it has a single variable called count, and it defines a method called receive. And that method um, basically can receive two different types of value. It can receive um, uh, increment by, or it can receive print count. Um, so what this is defining is it's defining an actor, which to all intents and purposes you can think of as an object as you're used to in object-oriented programming, with two methods, one called increment by, one called print count. Um, and let's see this in action. So I'm going to start up, um, this is a, a Scala um, command line which I can type at. There we go. Um, so the first thing I, I do is I'm going to create an instance of my counter, and I'm going to say now this is just a little bit of, of ACA magic um, system. Um, I've got a little piece of uh, um, setup here which is defining system to be an ACA actor system and system.actor of just creates an instance of, um, of an actor. So counter this thing here now is an instance of my um, uh, my actor and now I can send it those messages so I can do um, counter uh, exclamation mark is send uh, print count so unsurprisingly it starts off by saying count is zero because we've not done anything and I can say counter uh, increment count by oh, let's say 42 oops uh, not increment count, increment by. And then 
And if I print the count again, you can see it's now 42. And if I increment it by one, you can see it's now 43. So I hope what you're getting from this is that the, the style of programming here is very similar to the style that you're used to if you're writing objects in an object-oriented language. The question is, why does this make concurrency so much easier? And the answer is because all of this code, everything in here, is running completely sequentially. So inside an actor, we don't need to think about concurrency at all. The actor only ever handles one message at a time. And during the processing of that message, everything happens completely sequentially. And we can't have any of the memory visibility problems that we saw earlier, because the underlying actor runtime looks after all of that for us. It makes sure that in between message invocations on actors, everything that needs to be done in order to ensure that the actors have all the data that they need is done. Now, I know this isn't a particularly compelling example, so I want to show you something a little bit more complex. Um, and what I'm going to show you is this. Um, now this is a little class called buggy cache. Um, you may, you may be able to work out from its name, we're going to discover that there are a couple of issues with this, um, with this code, but we're going to start off with this buggy cache. So again, buggy cache is an actor, um, and I want the way, what I want you to think of this as is this is a, um, a cache for web sites. So you're, you're writing a, a piece of code uh, where you're going to go off and you're going to access um, websites, and you want to hold on to previous values. Um, because you don't want to go over the, um, over the web every single time. You need to get access to that. So we have a value called cache, which is a hash map. Um, in this case, it's a hash map from strings to strings. Um, and we're also going to keep hold of the size of our cache, so how many bytes we've got sitting in the cache. Um, as before, we have a receive method. Um, and this receive method can take three, method, three messages in this example. So it's got put, where we take a key and a value and we add it to our cache. Uh, we've got get, um, which allows us to re retrieve something from the cache. And we've got report size, which allows us to um, see how much, um, how much data is already in the cache. So again, very, very simple. Should feel very familiar to you if you've been writing any object-oriented code. This is very similar to the sort of thing that you um, you're used to doing. Um, now, I'm going to um, skip over for the time being this, but we'll come back to this post restart um, in a second. Um, you might want to start thinking about what's, why have I called this buggy cache? What's, what's wrong with this? Where are the, where are the bugs in it? We'll, we'll see those in a second. Um, you'll notice there's another uh, file here called master. So I'm going to do something a little bit unusual here. I'm not going to, rather than create an instance of buggy cache directly, I'm going to create an instance of master. Now, what master does is it basically takes the same, um, uh, or receives the same messages as my cache and just passes them straight through to the cache. Um, and we're going to skip over this for the time being, but we'll, we'll come back to it. But I just first off want to show you what happens when I, um, when I actually do this. So let's go here again. This is going to start me up a Scala command line that I can type things at. Um, so I'm going to start by creating an instance of my master. So there's an instance of my master, and I can do things like master put, let's say, on. So it's not the world's most exciting web page, but there you go. Um, I can, having done that, I can say master shrink report size. There you go. It's it's 18 bytes long, and I can do. And there we go. It all comes back. So the code is basically working. Now I want to start thinking about the bugs. So um, if we go back to our code, I'm going to show you some of the things that it's not very good at. So um, the get here, 
is just <laughs> fetching something out of, the, um, out of the hash map without actually bothering to check that it's there at all. So if I try to retrieve something from this, um, it's going to throw an exception saying that there's nothing available in the cache with that, um, with that name. So let's see what happens if I actually do this. So I'm doing something like master get, uh, let's say. So that's not in my cache, bang. But something very interesting has happened here. Although the, uh, the actor that we've just called through an exception, it's still running. So I can still fetch the data that was already in there. And the question is, why is that? And the answer is, if I go back to my master, this bit here that I, that I stepped, uh, let's move this up the window, up the screen a bit so you at the back can see better. So my master has set what's called a supervisor strategy. And in this particular case, um, it's a, what's called a one-for-one -one strategy. Now, a one-for-one -one strategy means whenever any of the things that it's uh, supervising crashes, it'll just replace them on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, and it's looking at a bunch of different exceptions. So in the particular case we were looking at, no such element exception, what it's saying is resume. So in other words, it's saying, I know this cache, if it experiences a no such element exception, it's safe just to keep it running. And that's what we saw before. But there's another example here, which is null pointer exception. So how can we do that? Let's say if we do master string put. So I'm going to put a null pointer into my cache. Now that's caused the, um, caused the code to crash. And the reason why it's caused the code to crash is um, if, oops. I go back to my buggy cache, we can see that put is doing value.length. So if value is null, which it is in this case, it's just going to call length on null, which is going to result in a null pointer exception, so the thing crashes. So in this particular case, our cache has crashed. Now that's bad. You know, we don't want bugs in our code. We certainly don't want things to crash. But because we're using a supervisor, because master is supervising it, and because we've said, in the event of a null pointer exception restart, even though our cache has crashed, there is still a cache there. So it's started up a new instance. And you can see that here. It says buggy cache has restarted. And sure enough, I won't be able to, um, let me see if I do report size. It says zero because it's restarted a new instance of the cache, but you know I can actually do things with it. So I can say, put Google back into it, and I can get Google. So I have a functioning cache. Now, this stuff is transformative. I know it, it doesn't necessarily look it in a little simple example like this, but if you start to think about what it is you need to do in order to write really reliable software, it's impossible to write really reliable software if you write sequential code. So if you think about it, what happens if the machine that's running your code crashes, the hard disk goes bad? The only way that you can be resilient in that circumstance is to have a second machine watching the first, keeping an eye on it, and in the event that it crashes, bringing up a new machine, restarting the processes that were running on that machine, and so on. You need to have isolation. So if something goes completely crazy in one of your processes and starts stamping over all, all the different bits of memory within that process, the thing that's looking at it needs to be in a separate process so that its memory isn't compromised. So in order to write truly reliable, truly fault-tolerant software, you have to write concurrent software. And what uh, the actor programming model gives you, it gives you through ACA or it gives you through languages like um, Erlang or Elixir, which are, which are based on a, a similar kind of thought, is they give you the tools to do this out of the box. And the thing which I, didn't, I wasn't able to show you here 
um, and I won't show you in this in this uh, this talk because it's um, it's difficult to to do in front of a room full of people on a on a laptop. Um, every single thing that I've done here can be distributed. These actors, although in this particular example they're both running locally on this machine. I could easily have them running on two separate machines. I could have one of them running on a machine here and another one running on a machine back in, back in Europe. And all the same communication mechanisms that you've got in order to communicate between two actors running within the same process will work with two actors running um, on different sides of the Atlantic. Um, you'll have a few, obviously, performance differences between the two, but the code, the structure, um, is completely identical between those two examples. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to first off write concurrent code which is correct, but secondly, go beyond what you can achieve with sequential code and produce things that are much more reliable than you could achieve with ordinary sequential code and manage to cope with, um, with failure in a much better way than you can achieve with sequential code. So, go back to our presentation. Um, there's a very interesting saying by Alan uh, Kay. Alan Kay is, the, is widely regarded as the father of object-oriented software development. Um, what he said is, uh, he wishes he hadn't called it object-oriented because that gets people to focus on the wrong thing. It gets us to think about objects. He reckons, and I think he's right, that the most interesting aspect of this style of programming isn't the objects, it's the messages. And messaging is the really in interesting aspect of that way of thinking about the world. And what actors do is they, uh, I think, implement what object-oriented programming was always trying to be. It's just that we didn't quite get it right when we called it object-oriented. But you can take all of the, um, the approaches that you're used to from object-oriented software development move them to an actor-based model with a relatively small amount of work and a relatively small amount of, of rethinking about the way that you break problems down and take advantage of all of this um, concurrency and resilience that's provided for you by the actor model. So, I said earlier on, concurrency is hard. Um, actually, that's not true. Threads and locks are hard. Concurrency isn't. If we have the right tools, then concurrent programs can be fast, they can be scalable, they can be resilient, and most importantly, they can be simple. But it's all about choosing the right tools. And with that, oh yes, and correct. <laughs> and with that, any questions? Yes, sir. So solving Java concurrency issues means more than scale up? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't go that far. Um, you can actually use Akka um, from Java. Um, I've shown you examples in Scala because um, I, Scala provides, to my mind, a much nicer syntax for, um, for seeing how this works. The, uh, the Java version, in much the way that Java often does, um, it, there's a lot more ceremony, there's a lot more verbiage. Um, but no, you could write pretty much exactly what I've written there in Java, um, and it would be a little bit more verbose, but broadly the same. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, uh, it was a great talk, thanks. Uh, most programming languages these days have like schedulers under the hood, like which manages like green threads, like Go has a good scheduler, even Atka has a good scheduler. And more and more, we are seeing uh, you know things like cache coherency and things getting better because mm -hmm. the scheduler knows on which CPU like uh, an actor or a go routine can be scheduled, so that the CPU cache and everything is like really better. So in this day and age, do you think uh, there is a need to work on like low level threads if you are an application developer? I understand like if you are a middleware developer and stuff, then you need better control over the threads that are doing the work. But for application developers, what do you think the future? I, is? I I would go further than that. I would say anybody who's writing threads and locks code these days is mad because you can't get it right. It, it's just impossible to get it right. And to say I'm going to write code that's wrong because the correct code doesn't go fast enough is to miss the point. <laughs> Any questions? 
Anybody else? Nobody? Oh, yep, we have. So, uh, we, we're, my shop's doing a lot of Scala, actually, and we haven't been using Akka cluster directly, but we're toying with the idea. But fundamentally, isn't, um, isn't the thing, are, are there other approaches that sort of guarantee serializability? I mean, because um, basically if you can provide that serializability through any other means, you basically get single-threaded access to the code, it's no longer, to the data, it's no longer shared in that yeah, sense. Yeah. So are there other, other, other approaches? Uh, yes, there are plenty. Um, I, because I only have an hour in this in this talk, um, I've cherry picked um, two which I, I particularly think are interesting. So the functional programming and, and, um, and actors, um, CSP is a is a very good way of approaching this. Um, and actually, I think the the, the closure approach of um, using STM and and, uh, and uh, agents and, and so on is also a very um, is a very compelling. Uh, technique for these kinds of things. Um, Scala is a particularly interesting language because it basically supports all of these different things. So you can do um, uh, actors using Akka, you can, you can write threads and locks if you really want to write threads and locks. Um, there are people who are looking at bringing um, alternative messaging um, strategies to, uh, to Scala. I mean, they're, they're all there. Um, maybe that's part of the problem with Scala is that it gives you so much choice it isn't necessarily immediately obvious uh, which is the right way to go. But no, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that I think actors are the one true way to, to do this. I do think they're one of the more interesting ones. And the thing that makes them particularly interesting from my point of view is this focus on uh, resilience and fault tolerance, which I'm not seeing in any of the other um, communities. But that doesn't mean to say that this kind of approach couldn't be brought to sequ uh, communicating sequential processes. It's just the people who are writing CSP code, for whatever reason, haven't chosen to concentrate on those aspects. Anybody else? No? In which case, we'll wrap things up. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One thing that I noticed that I didn't see in there was the disruptor pattern um, to the LMAX pattern. Any yeah. comments, thoughts on that? Uh, so just, just for the, the, the purpose of the people recording this, you were asking about the disruptor pattern and the, and the fact that the disruptor pattern is, is not in the book. Um, you're, you're dead right. Um, we had a long debate about all the various different things that, that could go in that book. Um, I have to say the disruptor pattern is something which I've not looked at in, in massive detail, so I'm, I'm not sure I'd, I'd want to, uh, to comment on it. Um, but I can certainly believe that it's another interesting tool to have in your, um, in your toolbox. Great. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>